Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And a very good morning again uh, Thank you all for carrying on And uh, thank you again to Dato' Azra'i For the very excellent presentation uh, I'm doing the second part And uh, I want to concentrate on a very important matter Of great importance for uh, in higher education today And is the issue of sustainability Financial sustainability um, a little bit complicated because the issue of sustainability at the moment is very much intertwined with uh, several things. So I want to take through that and at the end of my talk, I want to suggest how we can uh, tackle this issue of sustainability. Now, uh, we had the general election last year, uh, so the new government was installed. And we had uh, Ton Mahathir, a very experienced Prime Minister, taking over the job as the Prime Minister. But as you all will appreciate, uh, he is having huge challenges today, right? And many people say this, that uh, if the Prime Minister was somebody else, uh, this government wouldn't even last until today, you know? But because he's so experienced and there's a lot of respect for him and so on, so he's able to hold on and go on with it. <clears throat> so having said that sort of thing, uh, I hope I'm not creating any fear in anybody about the current state of the nation and so on. Uh, of course, what we have to hope very much is that this old man can live for another 20 years. <laughs> and then he can get one of the certificate that Dr. Azra showed, you know. For <laughs> uh, but so Dr. Made has been a very astonishing person. Uh, he seems to survive crisis after crisis. Uh, remember, his heart is, has been repaired twice, I think, or three times, and still going on. Uh, my father, my own father, when he was at his age, he was already sleeping all the time. But uh, Ton Made is able to go on and go on. A lot of people are asking so many questions about what is the future of the country and so on and, and more importantly what the general masses are, are, are thinking about the current government, what they are doing, but the masses seems to be split uh, between the uh, B40 and between the town areas and so on and so on and so on. So there seems to be some uncertainties. but. The few things that uh, we know what the government is trying to do is, first of all, is uh, what is given here, the debt problem of the country. And this very much affects the funding of higher education, of education, and so on. And I think you all will agree with me that even as of last two weeks, uh, <clears throat> the government has uh, uncovered more scandals, more uh, cover-ups and so on, isn't it? You know, and now we know that the Felda is uh, requires a lot of cash injection. There has been, I mean, this is all from the newspaper that uh, <clears throat> they have invested in very dubious companies and so on, re re resulting in huge losses. And then we have Tabung Haji and so on and so on and so on. So. I think the thinking of the government, uh, Tun Mahade and the finance minister, is that unless you are very sure about everything, you cannot pump in the money and grow the economy as fast as you wish. You have to be very sure what is your debt, actually. And I think when the current government takes, uh, took over last year, they were trying to compile all this, uh, what are the actual debts, uh, and so on and so on. And as you can see, even as of last two weeks, new things have surfaced. So that's the state of the current uh, <coughs> situation in the country. You see, because I, I mix around with a lot of businessmen, uh, investors and so on. Uh, there are a lot of investors outside there ready to come into the country to invest in all kinds of business, especially uh, uh, China companies and so on. Or even the China government, they want to invest. But uh, <clears throat> they see this uncertainty. And as you know, foreign investors want to be very certain. Lah. Okay? And of course, uh, these scandals and so on is one issue, then there are other issues in the country. Lah, kan? you know? uh, 
the issues of extremism and things on and on and on. So I think at the moment, um, given that the government is trying to sort out all the debt issues, uncover all the previous scandals and so on, I, my own hunch is that I don't think we can expect that the government will really pump any money into the system. In other words, whatever development, whatever growth, I don't think we can expect very much from the government yet. <clears throat> Although if the government wants to borrow money and pump it into the system, there's no problem. Uh, a lot of uh, organizations or countries are quite willing to lend money to the Malaysian government. Lah, you know? uh, but I think at the moment they, 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 they want to hold on and they want to watch and see. Uh, and, and as you all will appreciate also that uh, <clears throat> Malaysia is so blessed we are located in, in, in such a position within the Southeast Asia that anybody wants to be our friend. Anybody wants to come and invest here and so on, uh, location-wise, and then people-wise too. I think we have a very good mix of people where generally we are well-educated, we can speak English well, and we are a very friendly nation. We are not at war with anybody and so on. You know, uh, we, we are preferred compared to some other countries in the region anyway. But bear in mind that currently the government is trying to clean up and uh, I think we should not expect that the government will pump in money in the next two to three years. And, and having said this, I think it's quite clear that uh, if any institution uh, that is already suffering financially because uh, the PTPTN loan has been uh, drastically reduced and so on, I don't think we should expect very much that this will be replenished so soon and so on. In other words, uh, <clears throat> we have to continue to endure the pain and survive the current uncertainty. By the way, uh, it is not only private universities that are suffering, even the public universities are suffering. I, I don't know whether you know that or not. Uh, a lot of uh, research assistants, research officers, even retired academic uh, professors and so on are not given extensions and so on everywhere in all the uh, public universities. Uh, so, because of that also, uh, there's less money for research and so on and so on. So, people are expecting that uh, there will be a downturn in the overall university performance and sebagainya. Okay, so, so, so I think this is the current picture at the moment as, as uh, we are reading it. And uh, one of the biggest problems <coughs> that the government face, and this is quite a well-known thing throughout the world, uh, we are trying to clean up what, is, what has been the biggest scandal in the whole world, which is the 1MDB scandal. And besides that big scandal, there are many other scandals that come along with it. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we have become so known for this big scandal, which is uh, not a very nice thing for the world to know, lah, actually, but I think the fact that the, this has been a scandal and this has been a scandal that is uh, impacting <clears throat> badly on our reputation, our performance, our economy, I think it's a good thing that this has come out. And I think it is public knowledge too that those responsible uh, one by one are being taken to the court uh, and being pressed with so many charges isn't it? I mean, 40, 50 charges and it's growing by the day, isn't it? Incredible. <clears throat> uh, but Dr. Mahathir has always said, and he has said this many times, that uh, he wants to make Malaysia great again. In particular, he wants to make Malaysia as the Asian tiger again. Where I think the last, uh, since he left office, things have slowed down, things have not gone on very well. But he wants to make uh, Malaysia an, into another Asian tiger. There's no doubt about it that this is long-term vision. But whether he will live to see it, I don't know. You know? If he lives for another 10 years, perhaps. But this is ultimately what he wants to do. And you know that man has no interest in anything. He's already 94 years old. He only wants to see good things happen to this country. But 
the problem is there's tremendous challenges to it lah kan isn't it from so many uh, different uh, angles the challenges come and he has uh, actually said it uh, very strongly in fact when the cabinet was formed he appointed himself to be the education minister but later on he gave it up because uh, it was like a, <coughs> a rule that uh, the prime minister cannot hold any other position right but if not he would have been the education minister today all right so because of that now um, dr mazli has been appointed as the education minister so that shows how <coughs> serious he is to address the <coughs> education issues in this country lah <coughs> and um, he knows there are a lot of issues to be sorted out there are a lot of sensitive issues to be sorted out also in education you know uh, <clears throat> issues like the language issue, issues like the curriculum issues, why is uh, <coughs> uh, the education falling, uh, going by so many ranking charts and so on, and then you have the UEC issue and so on and so on and so on. Lah. <clears throat> Not an easy thing. And believe me, only Ton Dr. Madik actually can make decisions. Even I think the education minister will not dare to make some of this decision. You all agree? <coughs> For example, on the uh, <coughs> UEC, the Chinese uh, education qualification, <coughs> it was an election promise <coughs> that it will be recognized. And it was also the decision of the previous government to recognize UEC qualification, right? Recognize here means that the <coughs> people who has this qualification can use this qualification for the purpose of seeking government jobs. Just like <coughs> if you come from the normal system, then uh, the, the, the Public Service Commission will recognize <coughs> those qualifications as uh, sufficient for you to be employed in government service. This is actually a very sensitive issue. Anton Mahathir was the only one who could say no, we will not recognize for the moment. <clears throat> if the education minister were to say that, <clears throat> I think he has to resign in 24 hours like the Menteri Besar of Johor. You see, it's interesting that only this man can decide that. <clears throat> but this man is old. This man has got so many things to decide. <clears throat> okay? So... Uh, a lot is on his shoulders lah. and let me tell you the education portfolio is one very difficult ministry it is a very sensitive ministry <clears throat> not many people can survive this and a lot of past ministers do not even want to touch certain issues and they prefer to just leave it under the carpet <clears throat> because there's no solution to it <laughs> okay so for our for our colleagues who are from abroad who may not understand this, this is the reality of uh, the, the Malaysian politics, education, and so on. It is not, everything is not just black and white. You just decide based on whatever facts you see. Okay. <clears throat> and in his uh, recent uh, speech at Invest Malaysia, what is interesting is uh, whatever Dato Azrain has mentioned his speech, it is all here, this is the way forward. Uh, the Prime Minister wants this to be on, you know. This is the way forward uh, as far as investment in Malaysia. He is uh, saying that uh, we want to welcome foreign investment in this country, but foreign investment that gives value to the country, foreign investment that builds up uh, the country to be competitive in the global stage. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Malaysia welcomes foreign investment and so on. Okay, so whatever that to Azrai has mentioned about uh, <clears throat> in his slides, these are suits uh, perfectly well into the whole agenda of uh, the future of this country. And uh, okay, so he wants to uh, bring more. STEM, but this is always a challenge that uh, in many parts of the world, STEM students are decreasing rather than increasing. But this sort of thing, the Minister of Education can solve if he can, lah. you know. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
they uh, the prime minister wants private sector to play a bigger role <coughs> actually this country uh, if it can really make foreign uh, investors private companies to invest more that is the best actually you know you it is not good for this country to keep depending on the government alone to to prime everything but the government must understand that they must make it very in their investor friendly lah. That, that's most important and among that is to make sure that the whole public service is clean is not corrupted that if you want licenses you don't have to pay for it and so on okay but that was the previous problem lah uh, <clears throat> in 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 almost all sectors the <coughs> of government service from local councils to authorities and so on before this is all about this right which we cannot go on like that so so <coughs> we will uh, suffer if we continue like that <coughs> but do you think the fight against corruption is working <coughs> how effective is are all the steps now uh, I like to ask this question at this point of time because at the end of the day, <coughs> that is what Tun Mo Dr. Mahdi wants to do. Is it really working or not? Is the country being cleaned up or not? <coughs> no. Anybody more optimistic than that? <coughs> uh, I mean, Dr. Mahdi say we can always debate issues and so on as long as it is not seditious. Lah. This is not seditious. The, the topic of corruption is uh, is the topic of Tun Dr. Mahathir. Lah. So let me ask all of you, <coughs> is corruption being wiped out or not? Not yet. What else uh, Tun Mahathir has to do to clean up? What else? Okay, good, of course. <coughs> but, sorry? Yes, of course, uh, to reform the institution. Is it happening? Is it happening fast enough? Not also. What else? Reform. How do you do that, Dato? <laughs> <clears throat> Go for short courses. I want to ask you all whether this will work or not. We bring laws that China has been implementing. That means people caught for corruption death sentence. Is that a good thing or not? But uh, I don't think so because the uh, corruption is quite high in China. Sure, but the fact that if you are caught <coughs> for a certain amount, you can get the death penalty. And in China, they execute people very fast. The appeal process is all cut short. And you know, China has executed mayors and so on, kan? Sure, but yeah, yeah, but but definitely people are scared and things. Uh, I I heard now we the if you visit a certain university there, if you have some collaboration, the presidents are not allowed to give gifts more than I don't know how many Renmin B. You know, before they can give you very expensive gifts, now not allowed anymore. Ah, uh, so what do you think if we introduce laws like that? <coughs> Will it work in this country? Because currently the Malaysian lawyer, uh, society, lawyer group, <coughs> is uh, trying to banish the death penalty. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. So maybe we shouldn't uh, eradicate the, get rid of the death penalty. Keep it. Isn't it? So, so and anyway, uh, we are thinking here whether it's effective or not. <coughs> but I think we know that uh, I think Malaysia, in the last few decades, the country has been slowly decaying because of corruption. And to fight corruption is a big, big problem, you know. <clears throat> so we have to remember that trying to correct this may take many years too, lah, you know. And the uh, PTPT and loan. And I, I bring you straight to this slide because this is our biggest issue. Because a lot of... Uh, in the, in, institutions have closed or uh, <clears throat> uh, become insolvent and so on because of the loan scheme, right? Uh, whereby, uh, and then this gentleman here who is currently the chairman, uh, he actually drafted this PH manifesto, do you know that? He's in that com small committee who actually drafted all these things. 
So actually he should take a lot of the blame, it's not workable. <laughs> This one shyful actually uh, is now trying to solve an impossible problem. <clears throat> and let me explain to you why it is an impossible thing. Because in the election manifesto, they have promised, they change that uh, if the Pakatan Harapan government takes over, uh, all the PTPT and borrowers uh, will only be required to start paying back the loan after their salary has reached 4,000 or more. <clears throat> and because of that, uh, in the previous government, the collection was uh, <clears throat> something like uh, 300 million a month. But when this was implemented, the collection, uh, PT10 uh, recovering the loan, falls to 50 million a month. So it's, it becomes totally unsustainable. And for the government to go back in <clears throat> on their words is impossible. And as you know, Already twice, uh, proposals were made on how to recover this loan has to be withdrawn because of protests from <clears throat> all the borrowers of PTPTN and from the opposition. Why? Because of this promise. But this is not the biggest problem. There's another one promise that will, if not careful, will kill everything. <clears throat> but this is one big promise that the government has made, which is very difficult to solve because in fact, you, you see, for, for a Malaysian graduate to reach the salary of 4,000, how many years will that be? 10 years. 10 years. No, not even 10 years. More than that. Less. <coughs> okay. Five to 10 years, lah, uh, depending on government service and sebagainya, because a lot of them also enter government. But there's another problem. A lot of ladies don't work after graduation. If you don't work, how do you want to pay? Right or not? So a lot of uh, uh, female graduates who don't go into the job market, they have no income. So they rightly, by the promise, they don't have to pay anything. So now we have a situation whereby you have promise, we only pay when our salary is 4,000 and above. So we don't want to pay. So let me ask you, how do we solve this problem? Do you have any idea how to solve this? Remember, <clears throat> if the government wants to ban their story, they have a problem. But it is something they have promised and they have to implement. This is not including other promises like all highways will be toll free, right or not? All the depths of the Felda settlers, uh, uh, they will just write off and all that. Oh, huge. That's why the government can't even <clears throat> decide to pump in money because. But there's another big promise in education, and what is that? Free education. Free education. Exactly, sir. Free public education. And, it, and the word also free. Now, it's free education, free higher education. Uh, the uh, restriction uh, to public education is not in the manifesto. The manifesto says free higher education. Okay, so that's even worse, right? <laughs> 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 well, it's not worse, it's better. It depends on if you're a student, it's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, even currently, all the public universities charge some fees where students have to pay. And the fee collection in, let's say, in UM is something like 10%. Lah. But this has to be get rid of. So two things, the PTPTN loan and the free public, uh, this public education, uh, well, our gentleman here says education should be free, which means Sunway also cannot charge fees, is that right? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Should I stop now or what? <laughs> There's nothing more to discuss, isn't it? <laughs> so, education has to be working more on charity, right? It's not charitable, is it? That's it. it doesn't follow, it's a non sequitur to say that just because it's free, it's, it's charitable. It's not. Yeah. It's free at the point at which you uh, take advantage of the education, you will pay for it at some point but not through tuition fees at the time when you are studying. Yeah. You will pay for it if your income rises, you pay for it through higher taxes. 
there are plenty of alternative ways of funding higher education, sure. which will allow you to have free education both in the public mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in the private system. The private system only has six billion of revenue. That's all. Six billion of revenue is nothing for the government. The yeah. government could happily give the private system that six billion every year, and it wouldn't uh, blink an eye in terms of its uh, overall expenditure. But you see, with the shortfall, with the poor collection of the PTPT and loan, and therefore a lot of student borrowers now get much less. <clears throat> so the number of uh, uh, enrollment has actually reduced in the private institution. The public is not really a problem. And because of that, also a lot of institutions are already suffering, right? <clears throat> All over, you know? Uh, except for a few, but the majority are all suffering. And I know of one owner of a private college who told me last weekend, <clears throat> how do you manage this? He said, if, you want to, if I want to run this college, I must have students within the system. <clears throat> I cannot say either you're able to pay this, then I will take you in. No, cannot. Because if you don't take, then nobody will go into the college. And this particular college is doing twinning program with American universities. So <clears throat> the BBA runs into between 80,000 to 100,000 lah, depending which particular uh, American university they tie up with. <clears throat> and uh, PTPTN can give a small uh, portion of it. So how does he want to solve this? <clears throat> And so what he did is simple. He still recruit them. They will ask these students to go and get the PTPT and loan. They will take this money. The rest, the parents have to guarantee that uh, <clears throat> after the students graduate, they pay back the, the college. They end up doing this. But when you think about it, uh, there is a problem with that, in my opinion. <clears throat> You know, a lot of private colleges, and this could be in small towns all across the country, if they were to go and recruit from more educated families, they will never get students. You know where they recruit the students? They recruit students from areas where the parents are not so well educated, but they will tell them all kinds of stories and the kind of benefits they will get, the advantages they will have by having this particular American degree. And the parents there impressed and they are willing to send their children there, selling their property, tanah to ini. At the end, when the student graduate, they are still in debt. And not only that, I've seen a few who graduate from this college. <coughs> the Students, after having spent time looking for a job after two years, tak dapat kerja, they go back to their hometown and so on. And these are mostly from Sabah, Sarawak. <coughs> and they still don't have a job. But their parents have sold their property and so on and so on. What do you think of this case? Is it fair? Remember, these are students they have recruited. You see, these professional recruiters for these kind of colleges will not go to the more educated family, no. They go to all these uh, people who don't really know, but they think, oh, really? An American degree for this price is very good money, and you are guaranteed of a job when you leave. Is it fair or not? How, how do we, how do we <coughs> help people who are ignorant of all this? I, I think <coughs> when I know about this problem, uh, this thing becomes like something that uh, <clears throat> that haunts me you know in my brain it, it, you know uh, the, the the poor people in the kampong they, they may still have some property tanah and so on they are losing those property and yet after the children have finished the program after three years more they still don't have a job and can you imagine if you have two children studying in this college both of them uh, after graduating from there don't have a job and you are in debt for a few hundred thousand. What do you feel about this? Is it fair or not? And how can the whole system help to take care of this? 
I, I'm I'm very concerned about this, you know. Because when I visit, well, I know the owner of this college, when I visited them, when I look at them, uh, all these people come from remote places. Do you all realize this? You know? If you are managing institutions. You know, if, <clears throat> if the parents are well-to-do, uh, the parents are the businesses, and it's okay, you know, not so bad. You, you know how to sort this out. <clears throat> but they have sold properties. And thinking that the children, when they have the degree, they can come out and it's really sad, you know, it's really sad. But this is how colleges are surviving and so on. <clears throat> but I will come back to this issue later on because I think finally after thinking very hard on this matter, uh, I finally decided I think we have to be cruel to be kind. In other words, we have to close all these colleges that are doing this. We even have to close universities that are doing this. And how do we do that? I will explain how we can do that. I think that's the only way. Otherwise, you see, I, I don't know whether the education minister or the education minister even realize this problem. Because he may be thinking of the, 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 the bigger problem, but this smaller problem are the one that's killing the, the, the poor parents. You know? Okay, so remember this one big problem. And as of today, I don't think the the PTPTN chairman has any solution yet. They promise what? Come back in six months with a new proposal, right? Yeah. Do you think they have a solution by today? They don't have. Uh, what, what, uh, have you heard the solution, sir? I don't think they have. You require a miracle to solve this problem. <clears throat> Okay, so this, uh, this is what the minister has said. Lah. And UNICEF, University Selangor, <coughs> uh, well, the, the vice chancellor was my former dean of arts. You know? um, they are taking that as an example. But actually, when I found out from him, actually, not many courses are free. Lah. A lot of courses are still charging high fees and so on. And it will drain the resources of the Selangor state government if everything is to be free. You know? <coughs> And uh, and then they talk about revamping the University and University Colleges Act. Um, I'm not so sure what they want to correct uh, in this uh, University and University Colleges Act, which governs the public university. Um, <clears throat> I think I think I think you don't need to do very much to correct this. Only that. Um, uh, even now, the minister is telling, give more freedom to the students, let the students have their own election, they can speak anything. I think that's the whole idea, kan, isn't it? You know? So actually, this is not really an issue, the University and University Colleges Act. The real issue is the money issue. You all agree? <laughs> Ultimately, that is the real issue. Now, let us look what happens in the U.S., what happens in the U.K. You know, this gentleman here from Harvard, he has predicted that uh, there are about 4,000 uh, high-level institutions in the U.S., and he predicted that uh, within 15 to 20 years, 2,000, about 50% will close down <clears throat> in the U.S. It is not sustainable because uh, the U.S. model is crazy. The tuition fees has been rising many times higher than the CPI, Consumer Price Index. I'll show you the graph. Okay, so this professor, and he was recently challenged again on what he, what he thought, uh, whether he will change his statement. He said, I still maintain it. This is just uh, recently that, that he was asked again about this matter. So in, in, in the U.S., uh, uh, half of the institution will also fail, all because of the student debt problem. So our problem, of course, the total student debt is what, 39 to 40 billion ringgit. In the US, it's 1.5 trillion. Okay, uh, and, and this, this gentleman here says that uh, by 2023, about 40% of borrowers may default on their student loan. And I think there are a lot of articles that have come out which talks about uh, people who uh, borrow money to study, 
may not be able to pay their loan their whole lifetime. And surprisingly also in the US, you find there are academic staff who, who actually literally sleep in their cars, you know. I, I don't know that America has become so poor like that. Hmm? It's incredible. Uh, in the city of Los Angeles, 40,000 people sleep on the street. Los Angeles alone. Okay, and a lot of them are young people. It's terrible, isn't it? You know, how, how poor America has become. And recently there's also an article, associate professors are under deep stress because their salaries are not good enough to maintain their, the cost of living and so on, you know. This is how the debt problem has gone up in, uh, over this period of time in the US. And as of last year, <coughs> the, the amount of debt is uh, 1.5 trillion. I think now it's 1.6 or 1.7 billion. Lah. Okay. Uh, so so <coughs> it is a very, very big problem, and which means even the US government don't know how to solve this problem, you know. What do you think, sir? How would you solve this? If you have, uh, you are sought for your opinion to solve this problem. That we scrap the loan system. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's my advice to one side for when I met him. Uh -huh. So, the government funds everything? Uh, there are alternative ways of funding, one of which is from the government. Yes. But there are many different ways of funding. The problem is, as you mentioned, and I fully agree with you, uh, there is a moral hazard, and it's not the fault of the students, nor is it the fault of PTPTN, certainly not one cycle's fault, because it just took over. <laughs> so it's definitely not his fault, it's definitely not the students' fault. But you hit the nail on the head when you pointed out that there are these immoral, shockingly immoral, owners and managers of private universities who are mis-selling their product, which is their degree, to encourage students and their parents to sell assets and to go into heavy debt when they know for sure that they cannot repay that debt. Mm. And, it's, and it is particularly immoral because it is the low income people yes. who take out debt. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you actually saw this also. You know what I don't understand, well, maybe I, I should understand uh, that the owner of this particular college actually has got two children and both of them are being sent to the US to study, not at the college. Yes, sir? I, I, I've done a lot of work on private higher education and um, almost half of the institutions are basically bankrupt. But when I visit these institutions, there is always a Mercedes outside with the vice chancellor <laughs> and the owner. <laughs> and, and the buildings, the buildings are sometimes they are like slums. Sometimes they are dangerous buildings to be in. And yet, these guys running the institutions are dripping with money. And you mentioned that so I was wondering what is the connection between the, your comments on corruption and your comments on the management of these things. It, this is the root of it. It is yeah, yeah. utterly immoral. Yes. And as a, as a profession, we have to address it. Yes, yes. I, I'm very glad that you understand it, but I think a lot of people in the higher education industry don't, don't realize this. Because they've been paid, because it's the vice chancellors who have to acknowledge that, that their peers, their colleagues in other institutions are behaving disgracefully, and they don't want to do that because the, the, then the light is on them. Yes. People ask, Why, where is your message is coming from? <laughs> so this... this no, yeah, before that, I must, uh, before I forget to say this, this particular owner of the college, uh, the children are studying overseas in U.S. And he was telling me recently he went to U.S. to visit children, he has to spend 100,000 ringgit on the trip, and he has a brand new S320 Mercedes. Look, this is happening. And I'm telling you of my own friend who owned this college, even though, you know, uh, but then that, that's, that is what happened. Yes, uh, Punya. Yeah. High is a high, uh, very paradoxical that the so called highly regulated industry has this problem. <laughs> very good.
I, I think my last two slides will come to this point uh, really, you know, be, because actually, to be honest, there's no solution to this other than close all this. That is all. And I'm glad that this gentleman here who seems to know about this is agreeing with me. But for a long time, I say, if I were to say this, a lot of private institution owners will be very angry with me. But I think there's no other way. Unless we want to still to see a lot of these young people from Sabah, Sarawak, in all the Ulu areas being you know, impoverished. It is a very sad situation. Dato, you want to ask something about this? No, okay. Ulu means uh, in the deep uh, rural areas, deep rural areas. <laughs> Very sad. But anyway, the US themselves has this problem and they, they don't seem to be able to solve it. Uh, <clears throat> and this is how the tuition fees has been going. In, in this particular graph, the, 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 the graph to compare is the consumer price index, this one, which is the inflation rate. But you see the rise of the graph all above it. <clears throat> the rise of the tuition piece is faster than the inflation rate. This is what is happening in the US. And institutions seem to be up and keep on increasing their tuition fees. It's crazy. You know? So but I don't know whether the US government is brave enough to force closures of institutions and so on. By the way, it also happens in the UK. This is uh, from Universe, UK, Universities UK, I think the title of the document. I mean, in all my slides, I have these references given at the bottom here. Now, <clears throat> just one slide, because there are many slides there. I just, I just want to pick one slide from this particular report. <clears throat> <clears throat> this slide gives university borrowing total uh, for the whole UK scenario. The borrowings of the, univers uh, the universities in the UK are going up. Going up. You know, with the kind of fees uh, that students have to pay in the UK and so on. But they have this problem, it seems. And <clears throat> the particular uh, CEO in charge of universities uh, is already saying a few things about this. Okay, these are the income from UK universities. I plug this from the same report. Okay, uh, what actually comes from uh, government sources is only this part. The rest are from other sources, you know. <coughs> and but I must say that this portion that comes from government is a much reduced percentage compared to what is happening in Malaysia, Malaysian public university. Malaysian public university is much, much more. So, actually, in comparison, I think. Uh, Malaysian public industry is not doing a good job in in in, in taking care of the utilization of sources, uh, resources. There are a lot of wastages and so on, lah. Okay, uh, the vice chancellor of Sheffield University uh, commented that actually the, the the current problem in British news is that during the era when polytechnics were converted to universities and so on, they were building so many universities and so on. And not only that, the established universities kept on building, introducing new programs, uh, uh, creating new facilities, and so on. And this seems to go out of hand, you know. And this is the reason why uh, the, the whole system is having a problem now. And there are British universities now that is near the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, this particular report that I got didn't want to say which university, but uh, I know. <laughs> Uh, from what I read, I sense that uh, one of the universities in Wales, the other two is in England. Uh, <clears throat> they are not able to pay their debt. They are surviving on borrowings. This is very dangerous. You know, you cannot survive. You cannot uh, maintain your operational cost by borrowing money, and and they are already doing that. So it's out of control. You know, so maybe there's an opportunity to buy universities. In UK, I have a <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, um, and this gentleman here is the person who takes care of the, who works under the <coughs> Secretary for Education. He takes care of uh, ed higher education in the UK. And he has already said that he will not 
uh, bail out uh, <coughs> in financial difficulty. He will not. So the situation in UK is roughly the same as what is happening in the US or even in Malaysia, um, whereby the institutions are borrowing and investing and not thinking that it will be good. But a lot of people say that they think they must open up this new faculty, pump in more money, but at the end, the money didn't come. They, 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 they all their business plan doesn't work out. And throughout my years uh, managing institutions, uh, the, uh, actually I like to respect my deans and so on. <clears throat> but it is wiser not to believe their business plan. You know? <laughs> because very often, there's so much uh, assumptions which may be unrealistic. You know, I, I give you an example, a very interesting story which I will never forgot, uh, forget when I was by Sands of UM. There was a group that does study the pollution of the South China Sea. <clears throat> so they say, now we have to build, a, you know, like the oil rig, the platform in the South China Sea. This is 20 kilometers offshore. It will cost a few million lah to do that. And if we, this head of the center say, if we do this, we will be the first in this region. Our uh, research will be state of the art and everything. <clears throat> and he really wants the money. He said, no worries, half of it I already got. I want the university to give the other half. It's expensive lah, by the way. Imagine uh, like building that rig in the South China Sea. Let me ask all of you, again, this is... Professors telling you, professors who are publishing in top journals, telling you that he wants this rig so that I can publish in better journals and so on. Do you support the idea? <laughs> Why will you not support this? This is a real life story. Actually happened when I was vice chancellor. Do you, you know, he said, oh, come on, you know, just support us. Uh, we want to do better research. We want to be the leader in this, in on the South China Sea pollution. Some of you say you will not support. Why? Of course, the university has the money if you want to give. And the professor said we already got half of the allocation. Will you support this or not? No. It depends on the question for the research. Is it really impacting? Oh yeah, yeah. They will give you a list of the kind of research they can do if they have that station right in the South China Sea. Yeah, they, they, they showed all that. that all, no issue with that. But will you support this or not? Why, Prof? It does not cost, uh, it costs less than 50000 for one ISI journal. Less than 50000 Yes, one ISI publication. Okay, so your justification is from the cost for the publication. Uh, can any other ideas on this? Will you? S yes, ma'am. How many people will benefit the population? I mean, the taxpayers are paying for it. How many percentage of the population will benefit from their research? There are a group of about twenty-five academics in the whole team, lah. Okay, but of course. According to them, we will know exactly where the pollution is coming from, how strong is the pollution, how we can make our, seas, uh, our South China Sea uh, less polluted and so on and so on. They want to measure how much carbon is there in the atmosphere and so on. That, that's all lah, you know. <clears throat> Any good reason to say, sorry prof, I'm not giving the money. If you want, you find the money elsewhere. And what reason do I give to that? Remember, uh, these professors will be very upset if you don't give the money. How you say no? Of course, if you want to please them, okay lah, I'll give. Oh, he knows there is money. Because there's no secret in UM, everybody knows. <laughs> Come on. How do we... Justify this is not right. We cannot support this. I'm just giving an example how. Yes, anybody? Oh, yeah, of course. The professor will say yes. I argue uh, and I give one reason why I cannot support this. Of course, you know, 
uh, I will stand by my justification. And you know what I told them? In the middle of the night, once you have this rig, if three or four pirates come and invade this rig, how do you make sure that the pirates will not come in, steal all your very high-end equipment, which costs millions and millions, and that you can still make sure that it will still be there. And these are pirates who come in the middle of the night. How do you take care of that? If you can give me solution to this, I will give you the money. And after that, they agree. They will not go ahead with this. And you know, finally, what they uh, agree to, to compromise with, we will buy them a boat. Whenever they want to do measurement, take the boat. And when the boat is not in use, we put in the harbor in a safe uh, apa, marine, police marine uh, harbor. Other than that, hey, you want to go outside, take the boat. That was the solution. You see, the way I see it, if pirates come at night, there's nobody to defend it. If you try to put three or four UM security guard, <laughs> you know what will happen. <laughs> So, so, so these are the kind of challenges that a vice chancellor has to face. The vice chancellor, in some ways, is trying to balance the budget, but the demands from the students, the professors, and and and, and worse still, in Malaysia, the some of these professors may go to the minister, and you know that your this vice chancellor is not very good. No, it's not supportive. We, uh, we have this very good project, the, U, uh, the university has got money, but they don't want to support. One example. Or, uh, I still remember, this is another classic case when I was vice chancellor. A group of professors wrote a memo to the minister demanding that I be removed as a vice chancellor. And of course, the minister at that time, Khaled Norden, gave me the letter to comment. So I know who wrote that, and I know why they want me out. Of course, I never got this letter. Lah. They want me out. Why? Because this vice chancellor is not really uh, <clears throat> fighting for the cause of the Malay language. Malay language. A lot of things are now done in English, which is not helpful in the development of the Malay language. So for those of you academics who think that you want to be a vice chancellor, do you want my job or not? <laughs> and he, this, this good professor, he's from the American Council of uh, Higher Education, he said some uh, very uh, uh, <clears throat> justifiable things that he thinks that there's universities have become very costly, tuition fees has gone up, but the employability has gone down and there is a big disconnect between what industry wants and what the students are capable of doing. This is the biggest problem in American higher education. And, and the gap is widening. That's why I thought what Dato Azra is trying to do is one that can actually reduce the cost and bridge the gap. I think that's really the way forward. But U.S. has a problem too, lah, like what we have here. By the way, uh, uh, before I miss, this is a very important point. We talk about graduate employability as a problem in Malaysia, right? The industry has got a lot of vacancies, but there's not many graduates who can fill the job, isn't this? No, uh, to be honest, actually this is a very general statement, but the truth is actually, actually, it is the Bumi Putra graduates that has a problem. You all know this or not? Because if you actually break down the figures uh, in terms of the Chinese uh, graduates, Bumi Putra, Indians and on, actually the highest proportion is Bumi Putra. Actually, if we are serious about solving the whole employability problem in this country, we have to break it down into races. Not that we want to be racial, but that is the truth. Because a lot of the Chinese their employability uh, uh, problem is smaller compared to the Bumi Putra. Do you all know this or not? Why? 
No, but why do you need to break it down into uh, you know, uh, the racial proportion when actually, after all, bottom line is it's the quality of these students uh, performing. So if they do not perform well for that matter, then it's just that we see to the root of this problem and solve it. That's all. We don't even have to break into any racial yeah. composition actually. So the, the issue is this. Actually, I think I know the root cause of this problem. It has got something to do with cultural and so on. Lah. You know, it's not just a straightforward answer. But the truth is, the facts will show you that the Bumiputra graduates are the one facing this problem, actually. And, of course, uh, I, I, I need another session to, to dwell into those kind of issues, which I, I cannot dwell in this issue. Lah. But, but this is the truth. Sebenarnya, lah, if we really want to address it, Okay, I will arrange one talk about this, sir, you know, in future. And, and again, these are some of the additional issues in the American universities. I will not go through this. These are available on the website if you want. Okay, we come to the issue of PTPTN loan. Are you the gentleman who wrote this article? You wrote this article, right? I like this article, sir. It has caused uh, some stir in the whole community. But do you think the government has understood the problem now? One side all has no solution. <laughs> <laughs> and he's searching, I mean, he's a very genuine individual who is very positively trying to search for the solution. And he can present solutions, and I presented solutions to him, and he's presented it to the ministers. But the ministers won't accept it. They, they just are not prepared to countenance the idea Okay. For example, that you should scrap the loan system, mm. particularly because it was Tungmahatia who introduced it. So, they, and, and so if you give them alternatives, they really struggle. And it arises actually in the counter argument to what you were saying before. There is this view amongst ministers that students have a moral obligation to repay their loan. Mm. Yes, yes. And that because of that, they can never be given any remission of this loan because it would reflect on their uh, integrity in terms of, and it would give them a bad lesson that in the future they don't have to take that loan. However, the counter argument to that is exactly the, the argument promise. you gave before, that these loans were missold to these students. These students were given the promise take this education, pay for this education, you will get your degree, you will get a job. And in the end, 25% of our graduates, whether they're from public or private universities, are unemployed. And what's more, you mentioned about the threshold. The reason that the threshold uh, cannot be met is because the vast majority of graduates never get to that 4,000. Bring it threshold. And it's even worse for the PTPTN group because the PTPTN group are from low income to start with. So 70% of the students who are holding PTPTN loans, 70% of them never reach 4,000. And to me, that is immoral. It's immoral that they have been missold these loans and that these unscrupulous people who are mis-selling it have deliberately targeted the lowest income groups yeah. in society deliberately. And that is immoral. Does the minister know this? The minister, well, no. <laughs> the minister is more concerned about black shoes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So and anyway, for the for the information of the audience here, this article was a nice article that came out caused a and this is the author of this particular thing, uh, which is very true. is reporting on the current state of affairs, and uh, I believe uh, um, <coughs> PTPTN is uh, the real biggest issue in higher education which needs solving. But as our gentleman say, the the government has, doesn't have a solution. Hey, imagine, no, our government doesn't have a solution. How we go forward from here? Okay, fine. Don't have to answer that. Now, let's ask ourselves, which means PTPTN will have continuous problem or may even get worse in the future, isn't that right? 
Is there a future for Sunway University? You think? Is there a future for Taylor's University? Is there a future for help? You are from help, sir? Is there a future? Is there a future for INTI and so on and so on? What is the answer to this? Is there a future for Sunway? <clears throat> but uh, I, I hope whoever is uh, Sunway staff, please don't report it to the FHCI yet. Eh? <laughs> we, we, we are still trying to find a solution. <laughs> Does anybody wants to volunteer an idea on whether institutions like this will will survive or not? <clears throat> now let, let 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 me tell you something. I know there are some private universities that will survive regardless of whatever the issue is. I know there are some. And these are institutions that has got two things in them. <clears throat> private institution that has got two things in them. Number one, quality. Number two, they charge at the lower end of the private university fee spectrum. Two things, eh? quality, where their degree is recognized by all the uh, accrediting agencies, one. And secondly, they charge at the lower end. But there are very few that does this. Now, if we are to ask, will tailors lah put don't talk about somewhere, right? Will Taylor's industry survive now? And by the way, Taylor's charge at the high end. Will Taylor survive? Ah, but in the long term, Dato. Yes, niche market, five years, ten years. But 20 years, 30 years, will that survive, you think? <laughs> okay. Let, let me tell you something. First of all, I don't know which particular private institution, except for one or two, the rest are merely for-profit organization. For-profit. The, the non-profit is, I, I don't have to say here, but very few. You know in the US, the one that can survive long term are the non-profit. Which means whatever money the industry makes doesn't go to the owner's pocket. It goes into replenishing uh, laboratories and so on. So I, I don't want to tell you here whether tailors is, I think you know it yourself. The, the owners are in the business because they're becoming millionaires for that. And I think this is also the same as Inti, la, Help, la, and so on, right? Even though sometimes, they promote themselves as they have a foundation. But I know this thing. I know this thing. They break up the university component, asset under this company, this under foundation, this into several parts. At the end, to make sure that the owners get their dues. <laughs> we have a professor accounting at the back there. <laughs> so, so this is the truth about Malaysian institution. Uh, uh, they, they don't really uh, realize the true spirit of not-for-profit. No. That is why I always said uh, university licenses should only be given to companies or individuals that don't know what to do with their money. You know? Actually, not people who think they can go into this because they can make money. <coughs> is that right? Which means there's no way that any of the institutions will be able to build an endowment. No way. Because, hey, it's, it's money for the owners. That's fundamentally the problem with Malaysia at the moment. That's why the, that's why the, the government must understand this whole issue. Why it's so difficult to correct. Okay? But anyway, uh, our good gentleman here has just confirmed that as of now, the government don't have a solution and I think time is running out. They promised, what, nine months or what? They come up with that. Sir, I, on, I want to comment on your issue about uh, there's a moral duty to pay the debt. You said that. 
Of course the minister, the government will have to say that, right? But they have made a promise too. That is the problem. And I have met many graduates who tell me, not that we don't want to pay, but we can't pay. Cost of living is too high. <coughs> I have been working for so many years, I can't even think of buying a house. So, <coughs> how do we judge this moral issue in the whole thing? Yes, sir. Also on this moral issue, the research that we did, which is behind this um, article, looked at um, a very large sample of the private universe, and we looked at their accounts. <coughs> and we found that the money spent on the following things, dividends to the, share, to the shareholders you just mentioned, taxes to the government, marketing for the universities because they're all very competitive, and then salaries for the vice chancellors and so on. This amount of money accounts for 40, more than 40%, 41% of the total PTPTN allocation. So what that means is that the students are actually borrowing money to pay the dividends of the owners. And this is also at the root of the immorality issue in respect of the loan system. Now, my view is that one of the biggest resistance points from the government has been this moral issue. If we tackle and grasp this moral issue, and we, we have this consensus that there is something morally wrong with what's going on, there is something morally wrong, but the root of it doesn't rest with the students. We all have moral responsibilities. The government, in the government, the PTPTN, but the owners and the universities, as well as the students, all have a shared moral responsibility. And it's wrong to place it all on the students, the burden on the students. Yeah. I totally agree 100%. <laughs> um, it looks like actually the money is going to the pocket of the owners in the private institution. Uh, but let me tell you, I met many, many students. They say, do not ever think that we don't want to pay the debt. We want to pay. But I thought this government is going to help us with all the high cost of living and so on. So we only start paying when our salary is 4,000 ringgit, but now they are caught. I tell you, this is one issue the government has to solve, otherwise it may affect their performance in the next election. Because the young people will be very, very unhappy with this, and not only the young people, the parents too. Uh, it is a very difficult problem, but it has to be solved because they are looking at the promises. Right, huh? It will be the next one MDB because, <laughs> <laughs> you see, Wan Saifon makes the point quite correctly that the size of this debt, 14 billion, is the next largest after the one MDB debt. And he's absolutely right to point that out. Now, the one MDB is being dealt with through courts, but the next biggest one coming up is this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you are right to say that it will affect uh, the next election because we have one and a half million students. They each have parents, so that's three times that in terms. And then they have siblings who are coming through in the next generation. And so you're talking about millions of people who will be affected, directly affected so by this issue if it's not happening. Precisely. So you see the government is a very difficult situation. I mean, because of the over-promises lah. But then the government thought at that time if they don't overpromise, they won't win the election. <laughs> yeah. So so make new promise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, since time is short, I will not go through this. But I hear what I want to summarize is that <clears throat> from year to 2040, there will be a net increase of another eight million citizens of this country, lah. In other words, I think the demand for places and so on is there, lah, no issue. But uh, <clears throat> while it is good news in the sense that there will be continuous demand, but I think we, we have to solve these moral issues pertaining to the student loan and so on. Lah. Okay? But, but the, the, the population is going to reach 41.5 million uh, in 2040. That does not include 6 to 7 million immigrants in this country, by the way, okay? And, and as you know, this 
seven million uh, immigrants and so on, I think a lot of them will not want to go back home, right? They want to marry locally and become citizens, isn't it? They will have children and the children will go into the local schools, right? So that, this figure here does not include, so it could be 50 million lah by 2040. So there's a big market for private higher education. Now, I have a few things, and this is what I want to discuss, where I thought uh, uh, there are three slides where these are my ideas. <clears throat> and some of the things that I've been mentioning is contain this slide. Number one, I think there's no way. You see, while having said all this, uh, I don't think the government is going to really be able to pump in much more money lah, into the system. I don't think so. Because in U.S., uh, all the uh, <clears throat> uh, states, huh? state education authorities and even the federal government have been cutting on education. Their budget has not increased. And the same in Australia. So you look at it, uh, looking at uh, what is happening in country, I don't think the government is able to pump in more money. Lah. So we are looking at the best scenario today, you know, I think. If ever the government is going to be able to pump in, maybe slightly more. But Basically, the whole scenario in higher education, there's going to be short of money. Do you all agree with this or not? And if the government is going to give free public education, they cannot build any more public universities. There's no more money. And in order to control the cost of uh, maintaining the public university, they have to actually merge the universities and rationalize everything. There's no such thing as, oh, this state doesn't have a public university, so build another one. Tak boleh lah. And the government even, I think, has to be brave to close some public universities and merge it somewhere else. Because the cost may be too high to run it. So, the, I, I don't know which, whether the current minister will be brave to do this or not, but this will be really hot uh, debate everywhere lah if the government goes on this. Uh, apa ni? Uh, path lah. But I think there's no way but we have to close or really rationalize. First point. Second point, if you look at the operating cost uh, between a private university and a public university, I think the, the, the public university is running at too high a cost. <clears throat> I think I, I used to compute these figures before. It is easily three times. Three times, uh, you know, the operating cost for the same number of students, by the way. This is the problem. <clears throat> so you have to uh, correct these figures, rationalize things, and try to narrow the gap sikit lah. Maybe not exactly like the private, but reduce all the wastages and so on. Yeah, that's it. comment this because uh, there are certain subjects that are not uh, business driven, that not required by the country, by the nation. So the government to come with this and get this uh, faculty with the staff for that purpose, the non-tangible uh, types of courses, not the business driven yeah. purpose. You see, the MQA itself as an uh, accrediting agency has to be educated. That one, they have to be educated because, you see, the problem with the MQA people, a lot of them come from the public university. They have been used to all this luxury. They have been used to these wastages and so on. I think the government should be brave to appoint half of them from private and come up with some proposals on how to revamp the whole system. Because you put people who knows how to spend money but never have to worry about how to find money to come up with standards. Doesn't make sense, actually. You see, when I started MMU and so on, I used to be complaining about this. You know. But <clears throat> somehow these things, uh, the mentality of the government and so on, uh, they always would put preference to the public university professors and so on to... To, 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 to manage things, to hate. But if we want to survive, that practice cannot continue. 
impossible. We, in fact, I would even suggest that a lot of the public university academics, the professors, definitely the VC and so on, must be sent out in industry and learn how to manage money. They must go out and see how companies have to survive. They have to learn that there are colleges which have not paid salaries to their staff for six months. Where the owner of the institution says, we really don't have money, student numbers has fallen, uh, we can only pay 30% uh, of your salary. Uh, if, we have, uh, if we recover this, we will pay you back everything. But if you want to stay on, you're welcome to stay on, but <clears throat> uh, the salary is only 30% of what you used to earn last year. Have you heard stories like this? It's happening in the private institution. And I like the public university professors to see all this. Then you know what's the reality out there. Because this is the reality. Betul tak? Sorry? You see, unless you subject the professor into real pain, they will assume nothing to do with me. Right or not? And a lot of public university professors, if they are good at complaining, they get more money. Actually, they are they're thinking like this. They say, it's their job to give me money. I'll do the research, I'll do the teaching. Somebody else find the money. And the public university is unable to solve the money problem because everybody's thinking like that. Tell me, with all these, what, 20 over public nurses that we have in Malaysia, how many is actually thinking how to solve the money problem? Not, not solving like bringing in one or two percent more, but how do we increase our income 20 percent next year? How many? Betul tak? How many? And there are some people brought into the system, paid three times the professor's salary, they have not been able to bring extra money in, into the system. What is that, Prof? Because they fall into the system. Because they fall into the system. <laughs> yes. Sir, and everyone sitting here, just to, to make a confession. <clears throat> when I finished my job as a vice chancellor, I told myself, look, I've been telling people to be entrepreneurial. I have to subject myself into this condition and see whether I survive or not. Okay, I cannot now just go somewhere and get a, another uh, a contract professor job. Then I'm bluffing everybody lah. Because I can't even do entrepreneurship. And I, I vow, I make one vow. I will never look for a job. If there's going to be a job, the job must come and look for me. Luckily, there are some jobs that come to me. Otherwise, I'll be breaking my vows and I'll be a dead poor person today. But I am one man who never applied for a job after I left my job. By the way, even the job in UM as a vice chancellor came to me. I didn't apply for it. <laughs> you know, so I am a strong advocate of telling everybody, look, you are a real professor. If you stop telling me to recommend you for this job, in Go out there in the open field and see your worth. You know, don't, don't be always uh, going around, hey, can you contact that uh, VC and see if they can get me a job. This has to stop. So I'm happy that so far I'm still breathing. Uh, I don't have to apply for any job. And I think it's doable. You all agree with me on that? And I'm telling the public university professors here, you know, <laughs> I don't, I've not applied for a job and I have no intention to apply for any jobs. And I think if everybody has got this mentality, uh, the public university can survive better. Because you are, you are willing to face, you to take risks. And there's another very interesting thing which I learned in life, the, 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 the real life uh, situation. <clears throat> Half of my 33 years career as an 
in the academic field, half of that has been on contract. I was only a permanent staff the first 15 years. The rest after that is all on contract. When I became president of MMU or even vice chancellor, it's all on contract. I can be removed by just being given a one month notice. And a lot of people, a lot of public university professors are scared to go on contract because they think there's no job security. But I think there's no problem. I have survived so long. Uh, so I think this is also part of the brainwashing of public university academics and so on if we really want to save the university. If not, there's no hope. Because everybody is just thinking that, hey, where's the money? First is that, rationalize uh, the, the cost. This is what I say, the public is spending three times more. <clears throat> Optimization of resource utilization. Okay. Increase intake to public universities. Of course, some of you will say, well, I thought there's a student staff ratio, so you cannot go beyond that. This is where I think what Dato Azraing has been saying is very relevant because if you can do the things that he's doing, you can have students in campus for a shorter period. The rest, they go off to industry and get real life learning. This is why I think online learning and so on is important in order to reduce cost. Sebenarnya, but of course, MQA must understand this and the government must promote that all universities must quickly develop this kind of uh, uh, learning streams. So this is what I mean by the increased uh, intake to the public universities. And in terms of uh, penalizing, uh, uh, increasing graduate employability, you see a lot of university vice chancellors or even deans and so on is scared to take some of this initiative because you, you know, one of the frequently mentioned issue is the command of language, the English language. And I used to attend the Dean of Engineering Council with the captains of industry, and they would say the command, the, 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 the soft skills and so on is not good. But in the public university, uh, if you try to increase the number of uh, English and so on, you run into problems, you know, especially from, in fact, uh, when I was VC, I was, I was always reminded by law, by the constitution of this country, the medium of instruction, instruction must be in Malay. By law. If you want to teach some courses in English, you actually have to get the UNC VC to write to the Yang Diputuan Agong for permission. I'm raising this not out of disrespect, couple, but this is the challenge that you have to face, you know. But of course, the private university is uh, quite lucky that uh, all these hard-headed professors are not monitoring the private university. But I still remember those days when I was uh, president at MMU, I ran into a problem with the minister at that time because I say, how come MMU is using English and not Malay? I still remember the issue, and he was very upset with me. But of course, subsequent to that, things have changed. But that minister was very angry, and he was telling me, you are hard-headed. He told me in a meeting. <clears throat> and after that, I was in crisis with him, and it involved Ton Mahathir as prime minister at that time. But this is many years ago. Lah. Okay. Uh, so I think a lot of the students here must spend more time in industry lah, and must do entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of university academics, university professors, majority of them is very scared of entrepreneurship. Do you believe that? I have uh, uh, an academic who came back with PhD in entrepreneurship. And he, she went to one of the US universities, I think, one of the top universities. So after having a PhD in entrepreneurship, I want to test her whether she has actually changed. I mean, she has a thesis on entrepreneurship. So I actually call her and say, look, I want you to start a business. Come back in two weeks, propose to me what business you want to set up. We are not going to give you any money. You find the money. Come back after two weeks and let us discuss what is it. So after two weeks, this particular lady with a PhD in entrepreneurship came back and discussed with me. 
And you know what she told me? She's not interested to start a business. <laughs> and this is a lady who, who teaches uh, entrepreneurship for the whole campus. <laughs> That's why I think it is good if your academics actually are sent off to industry, or if you take academics who have spent time in industry, or if you take professors who have gone and set up companies and has failed. They are a better bet. You agree? You must find professors couple who have spent 10 years setting up his business, and in that 10 years, he has gone he has lost all his property because he has to borrow from the bank. He, when he, <clears throat> he used his property to raise the loan and so on. He lost all that house. And then later on, he rebuilt and became successful. We need this kind of professors in the system. Don't you think so? Because currently, I think a lot of professors are just theoretical. They don't know the real life. How many academics has lost all their saving, all their house? Have you met it or not? Academic, eh? I'm not talking about businessmen. And who has tried to set up a business and fail. Ada tak? Ada jumpa tak? Many academics. Those are the people we should employ. Because they have understood what is pain. They have understood what it is not to be sentimental about what you have. <laughs> Those are the people that we need. We don't need professors who are only good at whatever they are doing, teaching, research, and so on, but who are so scared even. And, and you find that, hey, you have been a professor for more than 25 years. You only have one house. At least you should have five or six houses. <laughs> I'm worried of that kind of suggestion eh? because, because not becoming bankrupt but actually committing suicide. <laughs> okay, revamp of curriculum and increase online degree. I really like what has been shown. Okay, uh, cut down face to face class interaction. So these are my, my ideas. We should revamp the whole public industry education, uh, get the students to spend more time in industry and reduce cost tremendously. Because in my opinion, you are not going to get much more extra money from the government. And I don't know when they will be able to solve PTPT. Because if they want to try to solve PTPT, the only solution is pump back money. There's no other way. <clears throat> okay. I think we should attract more foreign universities and build campuses in this country. Do you think it's a good idea? No? We must attract more. We might attract more, uh, but in order to be able to attract more, we have to give them facilities like uh, one, uh, foreign universities that operate in this country do not have to be subjected to MQA. They have their own standards there, right? Let them carry on their practice there. Like, see, if they are UK, they are already uh, assessed and monitored by the QA lah, of UK, and so on and so on. Why do we, they have to go through MQA again? We must make our system very open. Eh? One. Uh, you know, Edu City Iskandar there, uh, which is uh, not really successful. Actually, we should promote Edu City much more in Malaysia and build this across the country. Make it successful. I'm happy that uh, Edu City CEO has been removed and my former staff have been appointed CEO, and this is exactly what she wants to do build more city, edu cities all over the country. Yes, sir, you want to ask something? So, so there's good news in the sense that uh, the, the new CEO of edu city is going to bring in more foreign institutions into this country. There's going to be more foreign institutions to this country. But unfortunately, the evidence is that the foreign universities are the worst performers. <laughs> and what's more, when it's not just the foreign so-called branch campuses, they're not actually branch campuses, they are Malaysian universities, they're franchises. It's not just those that are failing. But where 
a Malaysian university has a foreign vice chancellor, they are more likely to be in financial distress. <laughs> so there is absolutely no evidence at all to support the claim that foreign universities would do any better than the Malaysian Malaysian So Although what you say about ed the uh, EduCity, I agree with, because this is an example of shared facilities. Yeah. Yeah. And because if you if you have different institutions not replicating facilities for themselves, but sharing it, sports facilities, hostels, things like that, it means that they can massively reduce their costs, focus on their specialization, uh, and give the students hope you would hope they would give the students a better experience, although I agree. In the past, that not so a lot of these uh, foreign universities that come to this country and in fact charging higher fees is always using the old model. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. You have to come up with a new financial model. If they come into this country thinking, well, they have a brand name so they can charge higher fees, better income, lower operating costs, is going to be a disaster. So I have told this new CEO of EduCity, first thing you have to educate them, you're most welcome to come here. We'll give you free land. We will help you in every other way. And we even say uh, foreign students can work uh, in this country. Uh, spouses of foreign staff can also seek employment and so on. Let's try to facilitate this, but come in with a different model, not with the idea of setting up uh, campuses here <coughs> to make more money because that model will fail very soon. And you are right, many of the uh, British universities operating in this country is under stress, severe stress. Okay? And I believe they should not be subjected to MQA. They must be given tax exemptions. Foreign staff operating, uh, working in this country also should be tax exempt. You know why it's so important to bring foreigners into this country? Very important because the United States, the UK, Australia has developed because you foreign brains go into that country. They are even offered uh, PR or citizenship. In fact, they say uh, Silicon Valley, half of them are Indians or something like that. You know? So if you don't have these foreign brains coming into your system, if you just rely on your country men, you cannot be competitive. You won't be able to compete. Yes, ma'am. On that point, okay. our country has sent so many talents overseas, whereas scholarships, yeah. they should come back and actually contribute to okay. the country. So okay. You have an issue of brain brain already. If you are going to favor foreigners over your local talent that you fund to go overseas, come back, no job, no contracts. It's another issue altogether. You need to reverse the brain brain. Ma'am, uh, at the end, the open market will decide. That's the best way. It cannot be a control market in this. Uh, at the end, the good brains must be happy to come and study here. The good brains must be happy to work here, to become design engineers, and so on and so on. It must be like that. Uh, a lot of Malaysians have gone overseas, got scholarship, but they are still Malaysian. With all their culture, their mentality, and so on. Okay? Um, just look at your public institution system. How difficult it is. I mean, a lot of professors know what are the problems, right? But do you think easy to change the whole uh, the University of Malaya to revamp it and and make sure we have a new culture where we are more uh, <clears throat> performing better financially and so on. So, so this is the issue. They are Malaysians, you know? So, so, yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with what this lady has just said. Um, okay. I, I, I couldn't agree more with what she said. The problem in Malaysia in attracting foreign academics is that they are not the top tier academics. They are very poor quality academics. <laughs> and they stay for very short periods of time. I've been here for 15 years. But the, the decision is either, either to stay or go. And most of them make a decision very quickly. They leave within a year because they just can't pack it. 
And actually, when they come here, they get found out. Because the Malaysian academics are very much better than they are, and they get found out. Now, if you look at these foreign, so-called foreign universities, they are not foreign universities, they are Malaysian universities. With a Malaysian license, subject to Malaysian regulations, they are Malaysian companies, they just have a foreign name. It's a franchise. It's like McDonald's, Burger King, it's no different. If you look at the staff, the staff are almost universally Malaysians. The number of foreigners is very, very small. And they tend to be in the chancellor. And that's it. And they don't even get down to the level of people. So, sir, the, 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 the fundamental question is, why is it like that? Can we change this or not? Because at the end of the day, I still believe that Malaysia needs foreign talent. The best brains to come and work here, uh, to invest here, to innovate here. Malaysians who are better. Okay. <laughs> and, and as this Thank lady you. said, they went overseas. I used to teach in Oxford. Mm. I have, I had m many Malaysian students. There are 17,000 Malaysians studying now in the United Kingdom. <laughs> they are getting a world-class education in the United Kingdom. But they, they are not performing. They, they don't come back. And why don't they come back? Because they're not given opportunities. Because they're coming back into a university environment where there is no academic freedom, no academic autonomy, for the individual academic, I mean. The salaries are very poor. The salaries for their, uh, their, their families are very poor. That's why they don't come back. It would be better to give opportunities to bring Malaysians here, world-class Malaysians from who were studying in Europe or Australia or America, bring them back. You can grow your own trees. You don't need to rely. No, look, uh, I'm not saying that uh, we don't have Malaysian talents who can do all this. We have. But looking at what has happened in the US, UK and so on, they have a mixture of local talent plus foreign talents. Of course, sir, uh, trying to attract uh, Malaysian talent back to Malaysia is another kettle of problems, you know, I mean, which I think the government knows, but again, like the PTPTN issue, they are not solving it. Lah. Okay, so, so there are a variety of problems, but uh, I think if we are able to open up the Malaysian system to foreigners, uh, for, the, for the bright foreigners to come and work in this country and so on and so on, I think that we will open up a new dimension. And that is also one of the key issues how we can uh, Apony make the Edu City concept more successful. You know, you can help the Edu City, and we need the Edu City because the government uh, through Hazana knows that we have to do this, because they have tried experimenting on Edu City, but uh, in the last I think ten years it does not really worked. Okay, so so we have to make uh, foreigners easier to come and work in this country, lah. Yeah? Of course, uh, no restriction to recruitment of staff and students, no language restriction and so on. So this is, because I know uh, part of the agenda of uh, Ghazana now is to open up more edu cities. They want to bring more foreign universities into this country. Yeah? And I come to my last uh, very important slide. Of course, you know whether we like it or not, unless PTPTN funds are replenished with a new amount of funds, a lot more institution will die soon lah. Okay? That's for sure. So the government has to pump in back how much and so on is for the government to decide. But this is not an easy thing to do. Okay, now my second point here. You see, at the end of the day, the only way we can stop the problem in the US from happening in this country is to make sure that institution do not have a <clears throat> free hand to keep on increasing their fees. You have to control that. And the only way we can control that is regardless of whatever your brand name or whatever, the government has to stipulate that if you want your students to be eligible for, uh, for the PTPT and loan, you have to charge fees over this band. If you charge outside this, then we will disqualify everything. Really, you know, because if not, uh, you cannot control this whole thing. 
Again, I'm not saying that, oh, a uh, certain portion of the fee you take from PTTN, the rest you pay yourself. No. If you don't charge fees in this band, totally, yeah, your, your students are not allowed to, to, to happen, borrow money from PTPTN. Then you, are, you will have some control already. Because as I showed in my earlier graph, uh, in the US, they cannot control it. So how do we control? We must specify this. And moreover, anyway, if the government were to implement what they promise, it will be free education anyway. So overall, the institution in this country cannot charge too high anyway. And there is where I come to my earlier point. I know a university like UTAR, I know I'm on the advisory board, their number is increasing, student number. The student numbers in Utah keeps increasing. Why? I mean, the president was my former student, you know, uh, in UM. Uh, he said our policy is to charge at the bottom end. And the PTPTN loan is sufficient to cover that. But of course, he is one guy who knows how to control costs very well. And because of that, he has good surpluses, which goes into his endowment, into the to Utah's endowment. That is the only way. But Utah is a not-for-profit university. So also with K Utah, College Universitar. College Universitar, of course, uh, late last year they have a problem because the Minister of Finance decided not to subsidize anymore. So in order to take care of that, they have increased fees by 20%. But they will survive. Why? Because they are charging at the lower end. Where that kind of fees, most parents can afford. Lah. You, see, you see the point? So my friend, uh, this is a very important point. Implementing this will solve a big problem in the PTPTN loan. Which means you cut off a lot of institutions their students will not be eligible to borrow from PTPTN anymore. Then you replenish the whole thing, you know? <clears throat> which means, which means, with all due respect, universities like Taylor's and so on, none of them can get PTPTN loan. But we have to do that, we have to be tough. Definitely the colleges which do twinning program, all will be out, <clears throat> not eligible. So this exploitation of all these uh, uh, boys from the rural areas all will be stopped. You have to be, you have to be cruel in order to be kind. This is what I mean. So, I think the way forward is, the government must satisfy this very low bottom end piece. Those who are able to charge only at that will be eligible. Those charge higher than that, that's your problem. And because of that. Uh, if such an idea comes and, and they implement this, institutions like Taylor's all will be out of business also. Lah. But of course, there are some institutions like Taylor's or Sunway can survive for the time being simply because of location and they are a catchment for well-to-do parents. They come from that kind of background, kan? where the parents have the money to pay for their fees. You know? But how many are in that category? So if you are located elsewhere in Ipoh ke mana, you will have a problem. Uh, why I'm saying all this is for two reasons. Number one, we know that the government has fulfilled their promise, free education. And secondly, you have to control this business of fees keeping uh, apa ni, the, the continuously increasing fee. So you must stop some institutions from uh, where the students uh, can borrow from your fund. And a lot of the money has to go to pay for the free public education. But institutions like what uh, Dato Azrai is saying, if we keep it to the lower end, give education to the masses, and give quality, you will also survive anyway. Provided the owners understand that they are not going into this for this. Itu saja. 
If not, no way. Okay? Uh, <coughs> the student, uh, the, the, apa ni, the government should not be sending any more students abroad. They are still sending, that's the problem. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, ratio of student loan to number of students supported must be improved, kalau boleh. But if you don't control on the increasing fees, you cannot control this. And the government must give all assistance to building endowments. Actually, the final part of my talk is about endowment. The only way forward is to create endowment, but the issue is how. Betul tak? I am experimenting with some universities that wants to buy universities in Malaysia that are in trouble. They have sought my assistance to acquire this. I give them one condition. If you want my involvement, you must agree to one thing. When you come in, within the first year, you must create endowment first. And I have given them a con the condition that your endowment must have a minimum of 20 times the annual operating cost. You create this, we are in business together. And then, secondly, you must uh, apa ni, charge fees at most 10% above the lowest in the market of the private university. If you agree to this, yeah. And surprisingly, there are institutions that agree to these terms. You know? Now, to my surprise, I thought not many will agree to this, but there are. They are interested to do this, one. And I think if this thing works, we actually help solve the current problem in Malaysia. Because these institutions all will be operating like normal, but the fees are much lower and they have an endowment. And I, as I told you, it must be 20, 20 times the, the, the amount of the annual operating cost. Which means with that money, if they invest that money, uh, a 5% return on investment is enough. It will cover everything already. So this is a way to force institutions to get into the business endowment. And I told them, you have one year to create the endowment. So, so, so I'm in that midst of experimenting and I, I must say that these foreign uh, agencies or companies has agreed to these terms. And hopefully this is a new model. Lah. Because if not, the government can keep telling people create an endowment, create an endowment, but nobody's creating it. But of course, your question to me, how these companies will create an endowment, right? Well, uh, I know how these companies will create the endowment, but the answer I give you will cost a few million, you know. <laughs> because if you know the answer to this question, all of you will become wealthy. <laughs> so that has to be explained in a private session, you know, not today. <laughs> now, uh, I want to put these slides here. Uh, if you think the whole world doesn't have money to invest on, so on, look, look, this is a graph of investment from China in Europe. Just Europe, eh? not including Africa, US, and so on. Now, uh, in the last 10 years, the amount of Chinese investment in Europe amounts to 318 billion in so many business, okay, ports. Uh, power stations, manufacturing, and so on, 318 billion. Uh, the darker the, 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 the countries means more than 100 over investment, huge investments, okay? And the lighter colors mean lesser. Lah. And so these are lesser investment, but these are very big investment by China companies. This is in Europe alone. Now, why are the Chinese investing all over the world, and especially Europe? Where do they get all this money? It's a good question to ask, right? But bottom line, at this point, I only want to tell you that actually Chinese companies are investing all over the world, including Malaysia itself. Uh, this happens to be like one and a half years ago on your graph. I couldn't get the latest. Uh, but inside this list of uh, apa ni, 
chart, you find there's a Xiamen University in Malaysia. Okay, investment in this country, but let me tell you, uh, from my personal knowledge, there are three more already bought by Chinese companies who want to operate in this country. And uh, <coughs> if my scheme with them works, there will be a few more. Lah. So, uh, the, <coughs> the Chinese uh, companies are coming also to invest in this country in higher education. They want to own universities. And by the way, if you say uh, this university costs 150 million or 200 million to buy, that's nothing to them. Very cheap. That is cheap. It's, it's not something they have to scratch over and uh, think where to get the money, no. In fact, they also know how to generate that money in a few months to pay off. And that's exactly how the endowment is created also. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say here is that I think we are looking at a new era of how higher education is going to be played out. The whole idea of uh, promising high quality education but charging high fees is going to die out. It will not survive. Why? Because I think the government has no means to keep on pumping money into PTPT and it's not going to work. <clears throat> and I think this new model where we get serious about creating endowment. You see, the whole idea is how do you create endowment? If you know how, then the whole problem is really solved, you know. But this is something that uh, I'm not at liberty to share in this talk. Uh, when this thing is done, maybe I can share. Uh, but uh, we are experimenting. But the good news is that uh, this, this, some of this investment, the, these companies that are buying universities in Malaysia has agreed to start off with the endowment before they even take over the university. So this is a good thing. And this is a good thing for a country, you know why? Because these you know, this, this, uh, companies have agreed that they will charge at the lower end. But a lot of these companies are willing to do that, not because education is their primary business, but my, by education is their CSR. They have no problem to spare some money for this purpose in this country. Because uh, some of them is in a business where they need to train their own manpower for the business. That they have because they will be employing 30, 40,000 people in the industry they're setting up. You see the point? So, actually, it is getting the right company who are willing to invest, who sees Malaysia as a place to invest. Malaysia actually is a good place to invest for some of these companies in the long term. Uh, one particular industry they really like Malaysia is something to do with aviation and with being the halal hub. They see this as a very good place to invest. The Malaysian halal brand is good and so on, including aviation, okay? And these are multi-billion dollar business, so some spare change for education, creating the endowment is not a problem for them, okay? So, so we may see the impact of this in a few years' time. Lah. So, so actually, uh, one of the biggest projects that will be coming in soon is the ECRL, kan, isn't it? And finally, the high-speed train to Singapore. Lah. But, but it is certain that uh, the government will go on with the ECRL project lah, built by the Chinese uh, apa ni, company. Eh? And let me tell you, a lot more Chinese investment is going to come. If the Mahde says, yeah, go ahead. Many uh, ports, oil refineries, and not only that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big project they're thinking where ships carrying oil will come and park here and then pump the oil across here and then another ship takes it to China. And you can cut uh, the trip by many days and you cut cost tremendously. Juga. So in other words, all these ships from the Middle East stops here Another ship waits, uh, uh, gets the oil and take it to China. A very cheap way. Canal not in Malaysia, they can do that in Thailand. But again, the canal project is going to be a very expensive project, one. And number two, it has to be built in a troubled region. That region is not very safe. There's no political stability. Because that's the shortest 
I think the shortest is 70 kilometers across. Uh, so <clears throat> even the Thai government is not sure whether they want to build that. Lah. You know? Mm. You, you don't want to build a canal and then every 10 kilometers some, um, some people collect toll, kan, isn't it? No? <laughs> so, so actually, Malaysia can come back and become an Asian tiger with more foreign investment. There's a lot of Chinese money coming here. A lot of Chinese company has gone to Africa, Europe and so on. But Malaysia is a one spot they really want to invest if possible. But only that, I think Dr. Mahathir is holding it for a while. Dr. Mahathir say he needs about two to three years, right? He said this quite often. So you have to tighten your belt for two, three years, or you uh, do some JV with some companies that has got money, lah, and change your business model. <clears throat> uh, since time is short, I will not go through all this. Uh, the, the point of all this slides is to say that actually we don't really understand what endowment, how to create it. And so far when the minister talks about endowment, it's not really the endowment. Actually, he doesn't know that even though UM has got this money, a lot of it cannot be used. Because they are mandated money. You can only use uh, some portion of it after so many years. So, it's really not good lah. I will take three questions, then uh, we have to go off. Thank you for listening to this, but uh, I'll answer three questions. Anybody? <clears throat> when will it end? Actually, I should not say so much about it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> because to acquire a university takes time. And the ministry is a challenge because they want to see on paper who is the owner and so on and so on. That's one. And without that, 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 that permission of the government, things will be put on hold. Lah. Okay. Uh, for, for this uh, endowment creation, they can start within one or two months and within a year, it's already full. The, the, the 20 times target is met already. So it is the bureaucracy that's taking time. Sebenarnya. But there are a couple of institutions ready to be sold because the owners cannot, I mean, the banks are chasing them and so on. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Ada soalan ni? Any more? Prof, maybe the last question from you. Make it the hardest question. <laughs> Anything from uh, Manipal? Yeah, Vice Chancellor? I'm sure you have a lot of questions in your head. <laughs> Where do you see higher education 10 years from now? Using your crystal ball. Sir, uh, Whoever is in power wants Malaysia to progress and develop, no doubt about it. Of course, how fast it will develop and so on depends on how long Dr. Made will live. Lah. And yeah, I mean, you all know that, isn't it? I'm not saying something sensitive. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying anything bad, but you imagine if Dr. Made dies tomorrow, what will happen? Or if he dies in five years' time? There's a difference, right? Of course. But that's the fact of the matter today. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that is the situation today, one. But I think regardless of whoever is in power, uh, whoever governs this country wants progress, wants development, wants to be competitive. There's no doubt about it. So where does that put? I think if the private education providers are smart and know how to remodel their institutions, there's a great future for this country. And certainly, uh, one, one factor that's changing a lot of this thing is that is investment from China. Malaysia cannot really expect 
uh, investors from US and so on, not really lah. Not not to the amount that Chinese investor can put in. One and secondly, uh, this whole area is a very huge market in future. The biggest economy will be not US in about 30 years time, it will be China. Uh, second is perhaps US or probably India. Third is US and fourth is Indonesia. We have a very big market here. And I don't think any prime minister of this country will be happy to see that we lose to Indonesia, to Thailand and so on. Unless of course, uh, we lose total control of this country and everything goes havoc. So, there will be demand for things like what Dato Azra is doing. But what is stopping the, the, that sort of thing is cost. And if we are sensible, we should address the cost issue and help to give bigger opportunities to the young Malaysian. That's the only way. If we want to be in this business. And the faster we learn how to create endowment and so on, the better we are. That's what I think. So there is definitely a great future for education, but it's just how to make the whole thing sustainable. What is the model you want to use? Itu saja. That's how I see it. I don't know whether you agree with this or not. And which means if you are in this business of uh, creating models for for survival of institutions, or you are in the chain of how you provide finance to institution, you survive for a long time. If you are involved in any of that, you have to be somewhere in that chain, either at the far end or the other end. Be in that, you are in business all the time. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, thank you all very much. I've enjoyed this session. Uh, I'm so privileged that I meet some giants in the higher education industry. I've been challenged, you know. But I think our ideas are not very far off. Lah. I think we are almost there. And we hope very much that the government can pick up some of these ideas and sort out the country's issues. Lah. Hopefully. Thank you all and hope to see you again.